Welcome everyone and good afternoon on the second Environmental History Today seminar organized by the ESEH, the European Society for Environmental History. And my name is Tim Soons. I'm from the University of Antwerp in Belgium and I'm very honored to host this session, the second seminar, which is on Portuguese environmental history and is a bit a showcase of the dynamics of Portuguese environmental history today. Um, it has been organized by Inesh Amorim, my colleague from the board of ESEH, who is the regional representative uh, for Portugal. And this session will be recorded also, and it will be placed on YouTube. We have a dedicated YouTube channel um, for this series of seminars. So everyone who wants to listen again uh, can do so. We have four short presentations today, 15 minutes each, and they will be followed by a Q&A. Uh, during the presentations, you can already uh, ask your questions in the chat. Feel free to use the chat for all kinds of remarks and questions during the presentation. And afterwards, we will have half an hour for discussion, and you can also raise your hand to ask a question. Let us start with the first speaker of today, which is Ana Isabel Lopez, who is a PhD researcher in history uh, from the University of Porto. And she will speak about drift sands and vulnerability of coastal communities in Northwest Portugal in the early modern age. Uh, Isabel, Ana Isabel, you have the floor. Sorry, my yeah, microphone still... is mute. Okay. I would like to thank for this opportunity to present about the drift sands and vulnerability of coastal communities in the Northwest Portugal in early modern age. This is part of my PhD project about vulnerability and resilience of coastal communities in the Northwest Portugal between the 16th and the 19th centuries that was financed by the Portuguese Foundation for Science and Technology. Sorry. Sorry. Now it's better. Sorry. Uh, since Middle Ages, some European coastal communities, as a result of its specific geographical conditions, along with the anthropic factor, have been affected by drift sands. On the northwest coast of Portugal, this geomorphological phenomenon occurred especially between the 16th and the 19th century, confirmed particularly by geomorphological studies. Since the 10th century, there have been cases of villages destroyed by drift sands, as happened in Kutberg, the Netherlands, that was buried by dunes and the population was forced to disperse to the neighboring places. Drift sands events had intensified since the end of the Middle Ages, as demonstrated by a diverse European, but not only bibliography. In the northwest of Portugal, there were places where similar events happened. And throughout the early modern age, similar events took place on the Atlantic coast or in other areas of Northern Europe. For example, there are many lost villages dotted around the coast of Northern Scotland and its islands. And in Portugal, and in Portugal, drift sand studies still something recent and has been explored almost exclusively by geomorphology. Using optically stimulated luminescence technique, it was found that since the end of the 14th century and between the 16th and the 19th century, there was a great formation of recent tombs and parabolic tombs. But looking at the landscape, it's also possible to find answers to our study questions. 
Historical data about thrift sand are even more scarce and come mainly from local historians, which use the geomorphological processes as a justification for seaports and maritime communities decay after the 16th and the 17th century. The same historical data has been repeated by historians and geomorphologists. Here, we present new data based on the rereading of the classic sources of local history in Portugal, and mostly of them are, are available online. Uh, the, uh, available online, which enlightened about coastal transformation and the role of communities. There are several sources that can be used for drift sense investigation in Portugal, mostly local sources. Here, our presentation is based on geographical and historical descriptions of the northwest coast of Portugal, produced during early modern age, and mostly of them in the 18th century by priests, monks, scholars from the Royal Academy of Science and foreign scholars that travel to Portugal, which contain information about local geomorphology, climate, and the anthropic activity that confer natural science and the aims to identify the intensity of the sand and its economic or social impacts in these communities. In some of these descriptions, the authors directly refer the occurrence of thrift sands in localities on the left bank of Mount River, in town and dark places, or more generally than on the coast of New Province, which correspond to the territory we studied, or that in the Portuguese coast, with the exception of the cliff coast, or which is dependent from the harmful winds or by pine forest, it is completely sandy. Other times, the, the information is not so direct, referring only the existence of dunes next to the sea. The descriptions also describe what may have been the preconditions for the occurrence of drift sands, namely wind or more extreme hydrological and geological events, such as hurricanes, and deforestation when it's mentioned the lack of firewood in Camilla village or in the south bank of Cava the River. The most visible effect of the occurrence of drift sand is the silting up of river courses by sands and stones. The mouths of Mingo, Lima and Cava the rivers are all silted and were unable to accommodate vessels with a large draft. For this reason, the rivers only allowed caravel, keyless boats or small boats. Sometimes it is also possible to perceive that these authors had the notion that siltation was a continuous process of sedimentation, becoming more accentuated in the last century, century when they write. For example, when it's mentioned the year of 1456, or that Cava the Rear River was deeper before 1730s. It is also mentioned the increasing inability of, of or difficulty of local communities to pay their rents and tithes since agriculture, agriculture is the most effective, especially between the area of Lima and Neva rivers. The Benedictines of San Juan de Neva Monastery only had one third of the income in 1651, and it was impossible to swap crop fields because it was very sandy. Also, in this territory, the sands consumed economic resources of its inhabitants and Braganza House that rented there many crop fields and common lands for a fixed annual amount. Also, in Santa Maria de Jareias, that was buried by sand, and I showed before in that landscape, many salt pans were submerged, although I, don't, I still don't know if, if it was in the end of the Middle Ages or, or, in the, or in the beginning of early modern age. Just as the parish priest lost, income, lost his income almost in all. Drift sands caused circulation problems on the main road of the Portuguese kingdom on Faro Hill that was also used by St. James Pilgrims, which was not very long, but it was difficult to climb due to the existence of sands, whether on horseback or on foot. As you can see in this image, the path is made of sand. These economic losses, with consequences for the well-being of the communities, influenced the emergency of migrations to interior or more protected areas. For example, in the extinct Santa Maria de Jareias place that was flooded by sands, 
the residents and their parish for succor, moving to a more interior space where they came to form a new parish or to neighboring places. And in Isposian village, businessmen and other people, such as fishermen, migrated. And in 1758, population had been reduced to 50%. However, we need to be careful with this demographic data because the author, a priest, seems to have exaggerated in the end of the description he has for hydraulic intervention in Cava the River that would save the city forever. But communities in this territory were aware that some defensive stru structures allowed them to be less vulnerable, and that if were not for these structures, structures, fences or forests, they would also suffer from the same mis misfortune or of some neighboring places. In Apulia, it was used fences made of wood sticks tied together. They call it tevish. And in Monserrat, the right bank of Lima River mouth, a fence was placed to protect from sand and clean the river, the Lima River harbor, but which proved to be ineffective. It is also praised for the ability of the forest to defend communities from sand and to make them less vulnerable, in particular, pine forests. For example, Cristiello. Christian and Muller priests in 1758 mentioned the presence of Camarillo National Forest, made up of cork oaks and pine trees, which defends their parishes from be, for being covered by sand. In these historical documents, it is also possible to find information about the occurrence of ripped sand in other spaces, such as in the central coast of Portugal and in Europe, especially when it's especially that it was possible to produce grain in sand lands, such as happened in Brabantia, or what to do for crop fields not became sanded, like happened in Suffolk, by using force to fix the, the seeds in the soil and then close them with shelter belts. But in this, in this investigation, I found the limitation of these sources. In the northwest of Portugal, like along the Atlantic coast of the North Sea, like in Denmark, France or Scotland, there are many references to the degradation of churches or, or chapels, or in extreme cases, to its destruction. For example, in Denmark, this church is known in Danish, the Buried Church. In Italy, I think that I will find this in, the, in, this, in this investigation, the information about the, some churches. However, this was not happened. So, considering the, this historical data, it was intended to compare similarities between the reality of the Portuguese Northwest Coast communities with other European communities along the Atlantic Ocean and Northern Europe, demonstrating that rift sands had no borders and coastal communities endured a common challenge with similar impacts on its daily life, the silting up of water courses, economic losses, difficulties of circulation or the inability to live in some place. However, it was also possible to verify that whether the locals knew that there were, there were ways to adapt or minimize the effects of drift sands through the use of fences or afforestation, which will intensify in the 19th century throughout Europe, as we have the opportunity to see in the last session. Similarly, Portuguese scholars who corresponded with other scholars or had the opportunity to travel throughout Europe in the late 18th century and throughout the 19th century knew that people could also resist the adapt drift sense and contribute to the wealth of its nation, or nation following a physiocratic thinking. And finally, European examples can also, in a comparative perspective, of allow to deepen drift sense studies in Portugal. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Ana Isabel, for a truly transnational story of the drift sense. In, in coastal communities, which is a problem, as you explained, which is common to areas all over Europe and probably beyond also. Um, we will discuss it later, but now pass immediately to the second speaker of today, which is Rafael Soares, who is a PhD student in history at the University of Minho in Portugal and who works on river pollution in the 19th and 20th century. Rafael. You have the floor. Thank you, Tim, and uh, good afternoon to you all. And boa tarde to the Portuguese listeners. 
I will just share my screen. Okay. Uh, can you no. can you see it? Okay. So um, first of all, let me thank uh, uh, the invitation and. Uh, I want to congratulate the European Society for Environmental History for this initiative. Um, my work uh, is about um, river pollution, uh, especially in a, in a, in a northwest uh, region um, that I will show you later. But first, uh, I want to ask what is pollution in historical terms? Um, it is a, quite a, a challenge. Um, we can say that pollution uh, could be something uh, that cannot be recycled, uh, something produced massively. Uh, we can say that pollution is uh, something like dark clouded or stinky, uh, something toxic uh, that affects our way of life. Um, even something that our urban society cannot bear inside. In, in Portugal, we have cases like uh, footprints, a footprint of industrial production, like this acid sulfuric street in, a, in an industrial compound around Lisbon, um, or even something that we cannot see, uh, like a molecule that arms uh, ecosystems and is this problem of uh, invisibility that made me wonder how to investigate uh, pollution in historical terms um, and I, I think that we have always to look uh, to four major problems, uh, four major challenges. One is that pollution could be invisible uh, in the way that its manifestation may not be captured through our senses. Uh, pollution can al also be immeasurable, um, meaning that um, the fluidity of the biosphere clears possible metrics. It can be unpredictable because its effects can have different results around the world, around different regions, uh, and it, could, it can be unsuitable uh, in the sense that it is not always possible to check the source. Uh, but let's look uh, to my research project. Um, I, I, I want to study um, the River Ave Basin. Uh, I, I designed the project uh, for, two, for four years. Uh, I have already drafted the, the state of art and I made a, an, an inventory uh, and I, 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 I proceed to the data survey from primary sources. Um, and I'm asking uh, four uh, major uh, problems to the sources. Why was pollution perpetuated? What was thought for its mitigation, concealment, resolution? How can we evaluate effectiveness of uh, these procedures and, and how to evaluate assessment made at the time? And what is the sensitivity um, or sensitivity of uh, those involved uh, to this issue. Um, the research background starts in 1892 uh, when a central administration was built to manage public waters in, within Portuguese uh, territories. Um, this administration is called uh, Hydraulic Services or Servicios Hydraulics in, in Portuguese. I will end in 1974 with the end of a political regime that was followed, of course, by vast changes. But I want to note that during all these years, we had three, three different political regimes and it, it will be interesting to uh, see if we can uh, note some uh, great differences uh, between um, fiscalization or uh, inspections so uh, starting in 1892, um, uh, we had already uh, the notion that uh, harmful substances could not be thrown uh, to water. Uh, and what we can uh, say about this uh, original document is that there was an evidence of a pecuniary action on 
the offender with fines, the payment of damages, even the imprisonment. Um, the criteria for uh, the existence of pollution is aligned according to three axes, like public health, marginal landscape and fish farming. Uh, state agencies like uh, uh, hydraulic services uh, were responsible for supervision and mediation in cases where contamination uh, produced unwanted effects. Oh, sorry. Uh, and the pollution potential was balanced with the multiplication of penalties, which could include uh, the temporary uh, closure uh, of industries. So, let me just show you what is the uh, River of Agrographic Basin. Um, the, the region found itself uh, delimited in the last quarter of the 19th century by successive uh, legislative texts, like other regions. Um, the one that interests us is River Ave, so you can see in orange the, uh, the section number two uh, in, the, in the organization of the hydraulic services, but here below you have the um, hydrographic uh, region that I'm talking about. So uh, our investigation will be limited in a later stage to the municipalities uh, covered by one of its affluents, the Est River. Uh, it, it, have, it has uh, another uh, affluent, major affluent like Vizela River, and we want to present various phases of uh, industrial occupation um, with uh, a lot of activities such as mining or uh, textile industries. Uh, but why, why was this region uh, so important in, in, in industrial history? First of all, what water was a, a primordial element of industrialization. Then uh, it, 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 it is a, ge a geographic region with a high index of uh, factories concentration. Uh, we know that the production modes were effectively highly uh, pollutants. Uh, the river was a testimony of multiple conflicts and is still nowadays the target of some pollution cleaning. So you can see again in orange, uh, all the basin that I'm speaking about. Uh, let, let's see the historical sources and data. Uh, so I'm studying the historical archives of the Northern Hydrographic Region Administration. It is um, directed by the Portuguese Environmental uh, Agency, uh, following what was idealized by, by the Archivar uh, project. Uh, so its organization derives from the creation of the hydraulic circums circumscriptions, um, which divided uh, the territory into several hydrographic units. Uh, and my aim is to, to quantify and qualify uh, transgressions resulting uh, from acts of pollution or contaminate, contamination sorry, that have been registered by authorities. Uh, so I'm just... Uh, um, uh, studying uh, a, a, a small um, amount of documents, the transgressions. Uh, the, 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 the first phase of uh, survey is, uh, is, uh, is concluded. Uh, the second phase is, uh, is, also, is also concluded. We, uh, we, we highlighted the, the, the transgressions uh, that were directly related to pollution cases. But uh, we uh, did uh, another uh, run in the documents to see uh, what, uh, uh, what were the universe um, related to pollution cases. Um, and I don't have a better graphic to show you, so I will use one of uh, Pro Professor Francisco Costa. Uh, in red, you can see uh, the amount, the total amount of transgressions by year. And you have a, a irregular, um, a sort of a irregular line uh, from the beginning till uh, 35, 1935. Then with the Second World War, you, you, we have uh, more uh, transgressions cases that were registered. Uh, with another dropping uh, with the, the end of the Second World War. Uh, 
and uh, then we have a, a sort of uh, irregular uh, increases uh, and decreasing uh, it is um, a very irregular line uh, another phase of my work uh, will will be to uh, do this just with pollution cases i i would want just to uh, tell you, uh, this is a, a, a very interesting um, tool to do a quantitative measuring. Uh, see, this is a book of transgressions where we can, we can see uh, a lot of fields that authorities uh, used uh, and they, where they register the information. Um, if we open the file, for instance, some individual uh, file, we will uh, see uh, a very, uh, how could I say, heterogene heterogeneous uh, compilation. Uh, but um, normally we will find four or five folios uh, and this is uh, a process of warning, if I could say like this. Um, where uh, we could see what transgressors uh, uh, did. I want to note. Uh, I want to note one thing very important. Uh, so here uh, in the D area we have the transgressions content, and then in the G area here we, we have uh, the river guard signatures. The the river guard was were, was very important. Uh, he, he had a, a, a special power because he, he saw the occurrence, he wrote it, uh, and in some cases the eyewitnesses were illiterate, uh, and often uh, transgressors um, said that they have nothing to do with the, the description. So we are analyzing uh, the role of the river guard in the fiscalization of pollution and contamination problems. Um, a part of these transgressions documents, we have a, 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 a greater universe uh, with uh, pollution cases, and this is a license application. Uh, so this, this is not a transgression. Uh, this is a license application to use water um, uh, from a little stream uh, for the tanning industry ponds. So you can see. It is very rich because you can see the, the, the water uh, entering in some phase of the production and, um, a, a, and uh, uh, coming back to the river. We don't know with, uh, in which state, but it is a very rich uh, information for historians. Also, this is a, a, um, a great uh, installation, in, an industrial installation right in, inside the bank. Um, we are still analyzing the, the potential uh, to study uh, pollution uh, with this, uh, in this case, with these building permits. So, and uh, to conclude, uh, I have a, a few uh, research hypotheses that I want to share. Uh, from an early stage till the 30s, there appear to be relatively few cases flagged as pollution. We have another cases, for example, uh, um, fishing with poison that we could assume as pollution. We are still working on, on that framework. Uh, since the 1940s, there, are been, there has been a greater effort to inspect the territory. And, and as you could see in that red line that I show you, increasing the number of reported cases of uh, water, oh, sorry, of water um, contamination. And from the end of the 50s, cases of industrial sewage began to be compiled in a separate division, suggesting that these occurrences are central to the daily life of uh, hydraulic services. And um, I, I just shared a small uh, bibliography, uh, some regional studies uh, that you could uh, where you could find some information about this specific region. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rafael. Um, 
River pollution and the modernization of rivers is, is a very popular theme in, in environmental history over the past decades, but I think it's important that we do not stick to only the, the largest river basins, but also concentrate on the many uh, s smaller and secondary river basins, which are uh, perhaps not the orga organic machines uh, like the larger ones, but they are equally important and much more numerous than the large ones. So uh, I think it's very important what you are doing. Um, questions can be uh, posted in the chat. We come back on that later. Now we move to the third speaker of this afternoon, which is Luis Pedro Silva, a climate historian, postdoctoral researcher at the University of Porto, who will speak about climate, weather, agriculture and food in the northwest of Portugal. We, stick in the, we stay in the northwest between 1798 and 1830. Um, Luis, you have the floor. Okay, thank you. So, <clears throat> uh, in this study, I, I intend to assess the impacts of meteorological phenomena on agricultural production in northwest Portugal between 1798 and 1830. This study analyzes and discusses two recently rediscovered weather diaries written in the agricultural region of Entre Dorimino in the northwest of Portugal. These sources produced by Benedictine monastic communities that used to own big farms in this region provide systematic data concerning weather conditions and are supplemented by a number of phenological and agricultural production records. So, as we can see in the figure in the map, the northwest of Portugal presents a rugged relief crossed by watercourses, defiles and narrow valleys with increasing altitudes from the coast to the mountains inland, constituting a large amphitheater facing west. At present, this region exhibits, exhibits a temperate Mediterranean climate with maritime influence. The annual thermal amplitudes are low, normally below 10 degrees Celsius. Summers are fresh and winters are mild, with only a few areas receiving a couple of light frosts per year. Mean annual temperatures range between 14 and 16 degrees Celsius. Almost every month is wet. There are only two dry months. Precipitation is high throughout the year, uh, reaching its highest levels during autumn and winter. Annual rainfall can vary from 1,000 millimeters in low-lying coastal areas to more than 3,000 millimeters at higher elevations. So, in December 1797, the abode primate of the Benedictine Congregation of Portugal, Frei Bernardo de Esperança Teles, established the obligation for each community to appoint a curious and perceptive monk to write the diary of physical, moral, political, and literary events without any apparatus of reflection with truth, conciseness, and clarity. The selection of the monk responsible for writing the diaries should follow strict criteria. If the diarist monk happens to be absent for more than four days, another monk should replace him. If his work is carried out, with high diligence, the monk is entitled to some benefits. The following instructions prove how rigorous the selection of those who wrote the diary was and how it should be right. Unfortunately, not all the Benedictine diaries were found. Today, we only know the existence of the diaries of the monasteries of Ganfei, Tibanes, Neiva, Renduf, Pombeiro and Estrela. In the first two cases, Ganfei and Tibanes, we find daily, monthly weather 
records for several years. In the remaining diaries, the content is mainly about the Napoleonic Wars, especially the Peninsular War. For this reason, in this study, we will focus our analysis on the Ganfei and Tibain diaries, both produced in the northwest of Portugal. The Benedictine Monastery of Ganfei is located in the border with Galicia, five kilometers from Valença, on the left bank of the Minho River. Among political, civil, economic and cultural data, Ganfei Diary includes a weather report entitled Weather from the 1st of January from the year 1800 onwards. The records are quite short and refer to singular days. Weather observations were regularly and carefully noted on a day-to-day -day basis without any interrupt any interruption from the 1st of January 1800 to the 6th of July 1804, when suddenly the records were interrupted. From June 1840 to January 1830, there only are individual descriptions on extreme weather events. The diary of the monastery of San Martin de Tibanes, loc located on the outskirts of the city of Braga, was started in 1798. The content is divided into four sections, being the second one entitled Physical, Meteorological and Medical Diary, which includes annual and monthly records about local weather and weather-related events. The first weather record of the Tibain's Diary refers to the harsh winter of 1798-1799 and the last one dates from February 1829. Between these two dates, the quality and the detail of the information varies a lot. Between December 1798 to Ju and July 1800, we have monthly descriptions of the local weather, complemented with information from foreign public papers and letters from Lisbon. Between August, I'm sorry, between um, August 1800 and December 1803, no such information was recorded. From 1804 to 1810, with the exception of 1809, the writer gave annual descriptions. For 1809 and from January 1811 to April 1819, this Benedictine diary contains qualitative descriptions of monthly weather. From April 1819, to February 1829, we only found annual descriptions for the years 1825 and 1828 and individual descriptions on extreme weather events. Moreover, qualitative descriptions of annual monthly weather were usually followed by information concerning the growth of crops and the harvests. Such reports are also often accompanied by the prices of grain, fruit, and vegetables. So, the Benedictine monks used a wide range of terms to describe weather conditions, followed by adjectives that express the magnitude or the intensity of the phenomenon. In Tibanj, they also describe the quality and quantity of harvests and crops in the same way. Based on these terms and adjectives, we develop indices for precipitation, temperature and agricultural production, converting the qualitative expressions into categories of intensity. The weather records were carefully examined through content analysis in order to build the best possible index. 
So as we can see in the table, the daily records precipitation from Galfei Diary were grouped into four categories and the daily temperature records were grouped into seven categories. The index value was assigned to each individual day. The monthly records precipitation from Tivine's diary were grouped into six categories. The monthly temperature records were grouped into seven categories. And finally, the information about agricultural production was grouped into four categories. The index value was assigned to each individual month. So, the final results show a number of outstanding extreme years or anomalies occurred from 1798 to 1830 in the northwest of Portugal. With regard to thermal anomalies, it was possible to identify a clear predominance of intense cold episodes, particularly in the winter and spring. In Gafei, between January 1800 and June 1804, there were 135 very cold days and only 76 very hot days. In the same lo locality and in the same period, 166 days were cold and only 123 days were hot. In Tibainj, between December 1798 and April 1819, there were 23 very cold months and only four very hot months. In the same locality and in the same period, 27 months were cold and only 11 months were hot. Focusing on the period 1798 to 1830, one must pay attention to several remarkably cold periods, as we can see in the slide here. Even so, this period was not free of warm anomalies. The summer of 1803 was interpreted as one of the hottest periods of the first third of the 19th century, followed by the winter, early spring of 1807, the winter, early spring of 1817, and the summer of 1818. As for the precipitation parameter, it showed a strong variability. In Café, there was clearly a prevalence of days with no rain, in all months recorded. The number of days with heavy rain was 47, while with rain was 350, and with little rain was 102. Only in eight months, there was not a single rainy day recorded. In Tivanj, the number of wet months was higher than that of the drier ones. 20 months were interpreted as very rainy, 28 as rainy, 23 as little rainy, 17 as dry, and only three as very dry. According to both the diaries, a markedly consistent drier period occurred in the summers of 1803 and 1814, in the winter spring of 1817, and in the summers of 1821 and 1825 to 1827. On the other hand, a markedly consistent wettest period occurred from the late 18th century to the early 19th century, in the winter spring of 1809 and in the summer of 1860. So our research shows that agricultural production in the northwest of Portugal was highly sensitive to short-term climatic variability and extreme weather events. The results reveal that temperature and precipitation deviations from the baseline climate adversely affect the quality and quantity of harvests and indirectly influence 
the timing of crucial farm operations. According to the Benedictine reports, the most common weather-related causes of lower yields or crop failures were excessive rain in the harvest season, as reported in 1799-9 and 1810, low temperatures and excessive precipitation in light spring and summer, as it was reported in 1809 and 1816, especially for vineyards, and above average precipitation and high temperatures in winter and early spring, as reported in 1807 and 1870, mainly for it and recrops. For the most part, these crop failures failures were sufficient to drive up grain prices, increase food insecurity and malnutrition, especially when combined with other adverse socioeconomic conditions, such as the French invasions between 1807 and 1811. In fact, the movement of grain prices in several local markets and the amount of, of tithes paid to Benedictine monasteries of the same region seem to reflect fairly closely the, the harvest fluctuations. So, conclusions. In this study, we, pre we presented the first high resolution index of temperature, precipitation, and agricultural production for the northwest of Portugal during the period 1798 to 1830, based on qualitative weather records from two Benedictine diaries. The results obtained show that docum A, documentary sources can be remarkably useful to reconstruct past climatic trends and extreme events from the pre-industrial period. They also represent an important tool to investigate the vulnerability of pre-industrial societies to climatic extremes and natural disasters. From this point of view, the Benedictine diaries represent an important new sources, sources which can be compared with other types of historical climatological data. The information obtained from these diaries has a higher time resolution and provides more details than any other contemporary sources in the examine area. B. The climate in Entredorimin from 1798 to 1830 was characterized by a clear predominance of intense cold episodes, particularly in winter and spring. The precipitation patterns present the highly regular behavior alternating between drier and wetter periods, mostly in summer and winter, respectively. C. Sharp deviations in meteorological conditions contribute to exacerbate the vulnerability of agricultural systems in the Entredorimin region, especially when combined with other adverse natural and socioeconomic factors. This study reveals that abrupt change in temperature or in precipitation, quantity, timing, and intensity had significant negative effects on crop productivity and food security, particularly evident in the years 1798 to 1803, 1807 to 1812 and 1816 to 1870. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Luis. Um, this is the period around 1800 when we have for the first time instrumental data on weather and we sometimes forget how important these more subjective, more local perceptions of the weather uh, are for our knowledge of past climate and weather conditions. Yes. Um, we come back on that, but we now move quickly to the fourth speaker of today, which is Manuel Miranda Fernandez, uh, who is a PhD student in geography, if I'm correct, at the University of Porto, and who will speak about um, invasive uh, species 
namely the phytogeographic transfer and circulation of acacias uh, in the Mediterranean region. Uh, Manuel, you have the floor. Thank you, Tim. Good afternoon, dear friends and colleagues. Uh, it is a pleasure uh, to be in this online seminar organized um, by the European Society for Environmental History. I will try to share uh, my screen with you. Let me see if this works well. I hope you are seeing something. Yes, we see it. We all also see ah. this, the, the frame, the frame. But... Also the frame. So this should work. Let me see. Aha. I think now it's better. Perfect. Okay, thank you. This presentation uh, is entitled Acacias on a Merry-Go-Round. So I invite you to a brief, a brief tour uh, through the circulation of these plants in the Mediterranean region. However, before I start, I would like to say that when I chose a, a merry-go-round to put Tagacious on it, I wondered who could have used the same image or metaphor. Uh, a notable albeit literary example uh, that came to mind uh, is Salinger's novel, The Catcher in the Rye, in which a merry-go-round plays the pivotal role in an episode near the end of the novel. As you can see here in this uh, illustration, a young girl, Phoebe, is running towards a merry-go-round while her brother, Holden, watches her gloomily. Uh, if you can listen to a jazzy version of Smoke Gets in Your Eyes, you surely know what I am talking about. Nevertheless, the merry-go-round of the current presentation is not a literary image, nor we are concerned with catching rye. In fact, everything uh, revolves around the circulation of acacias. So let's take a first turn. We start uh, with an article published in a Portuguese online newspaper stating that invasive plants are more dangerous than greenhouse emissions. Uh, I, I think that this article, uh, well, it is illustrated with the flowering branches of silver wattle, Acacia de Albata, uh, that is a plant that thrives in Portugal and other countries in the Mediterranean region. And I think that this title um, expresses um, somehow the anxiety we feel at the proliferation of certain plants, such as acacias of Australian origin. In fact, these plants have been labeled as invasive and are often perceived as having just landed in the Mediterranean reg region, bringing with them an ecological war agenda. In this sense, popular concerns are in line uh, with scientific perspective that is currently dominant over invasive plants. Now, let's, let's have a look at a different picture. Well, uh, these young ladies with flowering branches of mimosa in their arms don't look the least bit anxious. In fact, before the current, let's say, invasive anxiety, there was a time of celebration of these plants, both in Portugal and in other Mediterranean countries, where they bloom in the middle of winter. In Italy, for example, the mimosa used to be the symbolic flower of the Festa della Donna, the International Women's Day celebrated on 8th March every year. And, you know, it's not difficult to verify that the horticultural diffusion of this and other acacias of Australian origin dates back to the 19th century uh, with private and official nurseries playing an active role in its dissemination. In this horticultural catalogue from Casa Dopias in Lisbon, it is stated that silver wattle deserves a place of honor in all gardens for its foliage and flowering. In addition, the industrial planting of acacias started early, motivated by the raw materials extracted from them, such as firewood and tannins from the bark for the tanning industry. One of the most prominent acacia plantations in Southern Europe since 1880 
was installed in central in the central region of Portugal in a rural property that has been called significantly New Australia. But are Australian acacias the first to have been introduced into the Mediterranean region? To answer this question, we must now take a second turn in our acacia merry-go-round. At the uh, beginning of the 17th century, a different species of acacia coming from Central America was described from a plant cultivated in Rome in the Orti Farnesiani, the gardens of the Cardinal Odoardo Farnese. This was one of the natural curiosities coming from the New World, having an impact on European visions about the world and fostering the development of botany and other natural sciences. The original Latin name of this plant, Acacia indica farnesiana, represents somehow an articulation of the old and the new worlds in the Roman garden. From its native region in the Americas, this acacia has been introduced by human agency in many tropical and temperate regions of the globe over the last few centuries. In fact, it is currently considered the species of acacia in the broad sense that is present in the largest number of biogeographic regions in the world. Its presence in ocean islands and other territories along ancient maritime routes might even be considered as an early marker of the present day globalization processes. The diffusion of the Farnesian acacia in the Mediterranean region was initially motivated by its ornamental interest, but also to form hedges around agricultural crops. Its pods also were soon used as a source of tannins. However, the development of perfumery in France since the end of the 17th century led to a, an industrial use of this plant for its violet scented flowers called cassie. In the south of France, it was cultivated alongside other aromatic plants in the fragrant landscapes between Grasse and Nice. In some cases, like what we see in this photo, cassie was an exclusive culture, uh, its flowers being harvested by hand one by one. Uh, well, cassie and other perfumed plants were also cultivated in a colonial context in North African countries and the Middle East since the late 19th century. Due to the most favorable, favorable ecological conditions and the cheap labor force, French perfumery companies have opened branches from Algeria to Syria, where they promoted the cultivation of cassie a plant well adapted to arid climate. I do not know why these Algerian workers in the plantations of Shiri company seem so discouraged, but we can wonder if it was the photographer's fault. From the flowers of the Farnesian acacia or cassie, a concrete and an absolute are produced, which are specially valued in high range perfumery and cosmetics. One of the emblematic perfumes produced with these flowers is called Farnesiana, a creation of Michel Morsetti for Caron in 1947. However, the changes that occurred in the perfumery industry after the Second World War almost ended with the cultivation of the Farnesian acacia in the Mediterranean region. Currently, Egypt is the only Mediterranean country where this activity remains alive. By the way, on the subject of Egypt, we may raise a question. Where does the name Acacia come from? So let's give a last brief turn on our merry-go-round. As we know, the name Acacia was used by classic Greek authors such as Theophrastus and Dioscorides to mention a kind of thorny plant that grew in Egypt with feather-like leaves and flowers in small globes. Many centuries later, John Parkinson was the first to place side by side 
the Egyptian acacia and the Farnesian acacia in a graphic arrangement that anticipates their phylogenetic relations is a stroke of intuition. However, unlike the Farnesian acacia, the Egyptian acacia was only known in Europe through the commodities it provided, such as gum arabic. If we want to see these plants growing side by side, we have to go to Egypt and sail up the Nile until we arrive near Aswan. In the rural landscapes around Komombo, Egyptian and Farnesian acacias grow together, showing us that exotic and native can coexist, as we have witnessed uh, in December 2019 in Egypt. Um, Egypt um, is a place where the presence of acacias dates back to the pharaonic period, as you can see in the reproduction of this mural painting. Uh, it is an ancient testimony of the relationship between these plants and people, and in this case, also birds. Let's say a sign of cultural appropriation. Who knows if it is not the vernacular knowledge about these plants that may help us find the key to resolving our current paradoxes on landscape management. In conclusion, we need to recover the old plans of the merry-go-round and find a way to stop the endless turns of a debate on exotic plants that leads us to a dead end, or we may say, uh, where the arrival point is the same as the departure point. Perhaps a spiral movement would be preferable, embracing a more comprehensive reading of the conceptual and geographical framework in which Acacius sensulatum are involved. From this perspective, new ways may open to achieve a better coexistence with these plants in the Mediterranean region and elsewhere in the world. I would like to thank Geneviève de Rogi, Inés Amorim, Raul Pereira, and Veronica Teixeira Pinto, and also a special thank to Ari Priya Rangan and Nicole de Vivaretta. Also, thanks to SEGOT and the Fundação para a Ciência e Tecnologia for their support to this work. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Manuel, for this, these important remarks on, on the topic of invasive species and how this is, for anyone looking from a long-term historical perspective, it's always very uh, complex and a difficult name we talk about exotic or invasive species and you show this uh, very beautifully with the Acacia example. Uh, you can still ask questions in the chat. Uh, we will now move to a short Q&A. There are um, a few questions and I will ask the, um, those who pose the questions if they can pose them themselves or if not, I can pose them. Um, the first questions were for Ada Isabel, uh, the first speaker of today. Um, uh, Jim Galloway, do you want to uh, pose the question yourself or explain a bit? Uh, yes, sure, sure, Tim. Um, hi, Jim. Yes, hi, hi. Yes, I, I was interested in, um, well, sorry, interested in all the papers today. Thank you very much. But um, Anna, Isabel, I was interested in the chronology of woodland um, clearance in, in northwest Portugal. Um, the early map that you showed seemed to show that in the 17th century, there was still quite a lot of wood. So I was wondering when the natural woodland was cleared and then when the um, plantations of, of pine were were established in the uh, Caminha Molido area. Thank you for your question. Uh, Camarillo National Forest was planted in uh, the end of the 12th century and or in the beginning uh, of 13th century at the same time of, of uh, Leiria National Forest. Uh, Leiria National Forest is mo mostly known and the uh, deforestation, I don't have a, a chronology, but, the, but there are some um, uh, 
here uh, some uh, studies uh, of uh, Nicole de Vivareta uh, that uh, show that our deforestation in the end of the Middle Ages or in the beginning of the, of the early modern age. And that, uh, in the second half of the 16th century, there are several laws to, to reduce the deforestation and promote the re uh, reforestation. And in the, the, the end of the 18th century, there are another forestation fever that was promoted by the municipalities, by the religious institutions, and by the, the, the Portuguese state. Okay. Well, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. You're still muted, Tom. I'm still muted, thanks. Uh, <laughs> the second question was also for Ana Isabel from uh, Joana Freitas. I hope I pronounce it right. I'm not pronouncing it right. <laughs> Don't worry. Apologies. Don't worry. It's not easy to pronounce our names. Um, Anna, um, thank you for your presentation. I have read some of your work um, and I was curious because you said that there are some evidence of academic and scholar networks uh, and correspondence um, talking about uh, sand drifting and um, how to solve the problem, basically fixing the sands. What in information do you have about that? In this presentation, I used the Bonifacio, uh, José Bonifacio and Andrade Silva, uh, that was highly influenced by the Burgstorf count. And uh, maybe, of course, he read in the introduction of his work, he mentioned the Burgstorf count influence. And I also used the uh, Custódio Vilas Boas uh, description that he knows about the, the area of Dunkirk, uh, Belgium, um, uh, the, knows about that area because of his godfather that uh, he went there to study hydraulic and military engineer and uh, his godfather that has the same uh, the same name uh, translate and uh, and his uh, and Custódio Villabelas talks about the, the work of his godfather in this description. However, the maybe the description of his godfather do not uh, exist today because they were, they were burnt in the 18th, 10th century by the population. Thank you, Anna. Uh, I, uh, well, I know the work of Bonifacio and I'm going to check also Custodio Village Wars because this is a team that I'm very interested in. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, then I have a question by Sam Grinsel uh, for Luis. Hi, Luis, and um, thank you for your presentation. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I hope you can hear me okay. I've been having some sound problems. Okay, Tim's giving me a thumbs up. Um, I, I wondered, you spoke very interestingly about how you've constructed um, the his, uh, the climatic conditions in the early, the early 19th century. Um, I, I wonder if you have any ideas about how the pressures on food security that you mentioned, for example, might also shape political or social um, pressures at that time. Um, do you have, even if it's not something you're necessarily thinking about very directly, do you have thoughts on how the climate might itself be acting as a historical agent in pushing these societies to respond in particular ways? Okay, thank you for your question. So uh, in my study, I avoid climatic determinist interpretations. However, my, my study shows that the weather has a significant and direct impact on some economic and social process, namely on agricultural production. Uh, the, the movement of grain prices in five local markets in Entredorimin, in the northwest of Portugal, and the amount of tithes paid to three Benedictine monasteries of the same region show that in most cases, the high price of grains and the shrinkage of the tithe tax revenues are given by the ba bad harvests of the given or the preceding year 
triggered by strong thermal and rainfall variability with high amplitude anomalies, and sometimes, of course, by other political, military, and social factors. Uh, of course, the, co the, the cause, the, the Yes, the costs of this agrarian crisis are not limited to the to the weather. Other historical factors contributed to the the crops productivity. Yeah. Thank you. That's that's really interesting how these different these different types of time and action unfold together. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Especially in the Tambora years, as we know. Yes. Yes. Um, uh, the next question is from uh, Inesh. Welcome, Inesh. Sorry, it's not a question, it's a comment. <laughs> uh, of course, you have more questions, so it's only to, uh, to comment the, 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 the contributions of these uh, four uh, researchers, because I believe that we are in a microanalysis, of course, uh, but uh, big issues. And uh, the question, uh, of course, the Manuel Miranda seems uh, an, a global, a more global uh, approach, but of course there's uh, something that he, he hasn't presented in this moment, is research about the case in Portugal. What is in this big picture? So I have this question to Manuel. In this big uh, picture, the particularity in Portugal. Have you something to talk about that? Uh, but firstly, um, I appreciate a lot the the, the contributions and the, the approach, the questions, the methodology, the sources. It seemed very important for young researchers to uh, follow uh, uh, a methodology that could uh, compare different uh, studies in the long, uh, the big picture of European or even world contributions. So thank you so much. Thank you, Inesh. Um, Manuel? Oh, yes. Um, boa tarde, professor Inês. Thank you so much for your question. Uh, what is particular about acacias in Portugal? Well, perhaps a lack of memory, I would say. Um, the first acacia that we know that has been introduced in Portugal has been registered in the 17th century, of, and it was, of course, an acacia farnesiana. But only from the mid 19th century, Australian acacias began to flow to Portugal and as well as uh, Europe and the Mediterranean region. And they have been so well received. Um, they were fashionable plants. Um, and well, this sort of attitude before acacias um, goes for several decades, goes for almost a century. But then suddenly, uh, at the beginning of the 1960s, things begin to change. And what changes is mostly the discourse over these plants. And uh, it is linked to the occurrence of forest fires, uh, especially uh, in Sintra near Lisbon, where uh, it has been observed that responding to fires, this uh, case in Australia's Australia's began to proliferate. And I think um, this marks um, the, the turning point when the discourse uh, over these plants, over these plant, plants changes in Portugal. And not, uh, well, not a long time after this, uh, they begin to be demonized plants and their presence um, uh, totally, uh, well, let's say, uh, began to be envisaged uh, in a totally different uh, manner. They were uh, no longer um, welcomed plants, but they were some sort of aliens, whatever that is, that we should eradicate. Th uh, that is the, 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 the point and, the, uh, well, 
that is part of the process that happened in Portugal. I'm not sure it is, is um, totally original. I think that um, somehow the same happened in other uh, European countries. Uh, but we can still nowadays uh, watch some signs of a coexistence between uh, two discourses, the scientific discourse that promotes the eradication of these plants and um, a, a different type of discourse that, um, um, uh, well, let's say, uh, considers that these plants, they, are, they, they should be present, they are uh, economically uh, valuable plants. Uh, in short, this is what I have to say for the moment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Manuel. Um, there was one question on the chat left, which was by Leonard Jensen. Good afternoon, Leonard. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I had a question for Anna. Uh, how did increased commercialization in agriculture and forestry affect the occurrency of the sand drifts? Uh, do you see a clear link here uh, due to deforestation or the increase of arable land that the sand drifts increase in frequency? And also because I was really interested in these local practices, uh, how are these affected by commercialization? Thank you for your question, Len. Uh, in, in my work, I, uh, the, in, in agriculture, there are, I guess, I, there are no um, directly effects because in, the, in this the area that I study, in the northern uh, coast of Portugal, it is uh, agriculture is uh, there are no big plans for commercialization. It's for home, it's uh, yard to home. There are no big plans of uh, of commercialization. Maybe the forest, the it's a more problem, but I don't know. I don't study it yet. The shipbuilding. There are some some works about the the shipbuilding and the effects on the deforestation. But uh, in, in my investigation, what were the, the main problems were the local practices with the cattle, the cows and goats, the taking uh, the beach grass uh, near, uh, on, the, on the beach or near the rivers, and the, the, the climatic factor of, because of the winds, not the north, north winds. And the, uh, I, in my master thesis, I studied local, uh, especially the local practices to reduce the vulnerability. I studied the local tax that um, was um, between the 1836 and 1870 that uh, we, um, that the municipal municipality uh, um, hired in a in a local. Uh, hired the women to plant trees to remove sand from the fences when the, there were floods and storms and to buy pine nuts uh, and uh, to, to buy uh, wood to make fences they were on the boats and come back with the wood on the boats and the, 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 the central government and uh, maybe until the, the end of the uh, 19th century, there was no uh, a big role. There were especially the, the local practices that uh, uh, that uh, um, they that they possible that they make possible to reduce the vulnerability. And the, there were uh, um, punishments against the. For example, the the, the tree uh, cut cut off the trees. And uh, I work with this taxi, but uh, in the early modern age, there are more cases in the in the in this local where that uh, that I studied uh, about local. There was a cyclic te taxis to remove sand to rebuild the 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 parish church. The, and they made walls in the in the in around the, the church to, to prevent they they that become sanded. Hey, thank you for your interesting answer. Thank you very much. Um, 
if I may, if I may, I have a follow-up question which connects a bit um, different papers, uh, the ones from Ana Isabel, uh, Louis, and perhaps also Manuel. I don't know if any of you uses the concept of the commons and um, the management of the commons. I see the dune lands, the dunes you are studying, Ana Isabel, before the state enters, they are often managed as a common. So you mentioned the municipality, but often it's also the users of the land who organize the maintenance of, of the dune lands. I wonder whether this is the case and if you use the concept of common. And um, this is um, also in Raphael's paper uh, on, on the river management. And you see, of course, in the later period also the state entering in and with the transgressions you study, but are there any signs of this sort of communal maintenance of the rivers? And that also in the case of these rivers, their embankment, the um, cleanliness of the rivers, the, the, the use of the water, there are there is a sort of communal framework. So it's a sort of, can you label the river as a common? And then um, for Manuel, I don't know whether um, also you see the plantations which are introduced uh, for the perfumes and the, um, um, which is of course also again, the sort of modernization um, of the uh, land use, which, which might eradicate former communal uses of land. So is, is the acacia in that sense, something which is introduced, always introduced from outside, or is it also, as you seem to argue, encapsulated in, uh, embedded in these local uses, practices, and perhaps the common is also a uh, connection to your paper. I don't know if any of you wants to comment on that. Sure, can I start? That's a, an interesting framework. I, I'm, I'm not very uh, familiar with uh, Garrett's, um, with Garrett Ardin's work about the tragedy of the commons, but we can say that in the river um, management that there were permanent tragedy uh, in, in the commons, uh, in the sense that um, um, I feel that um, Hydraulic services, so the the central administration um, was built, uh, uh, but not but it not created uh, the conflicts that we that we could see in the river. So uh, the central administration just um, um, how could I say? Uh, um, it was not the, the, the main cause of the conflicts uh, within the commons. Uh, it registered those conflicts. Uh, and so uh, I think in, in, the, in the first phase of the documents that we have already saw, uh, uh, it is very explicit, the permanent uh, conflicts around, for example, water uses, domestic purposes, um, small, uh, small uh, meals. And so the river becomes a, a permanent uh, space for litigation uh, and for all kind of uses. Uh, that's my comment. Okay, thank you. No enclosure conflicts. Uh or not enclosure as the base of the conflict. Uh, I don't know if Anna, Isabel or Manuel wants to add something on that. I, in my presentation, I mentioned the, the commons, uh, type of commons in Portugal, uh, Meninos, that uh, were affected by, by, uh, by the drift sands and uh, that was rented for Braganza House, the, the, the royal house. And, uh, and there are, but I, I have to investigate more about them. Uh, but I think they are next to the to the beach. Uh, 
and the, that that's why they they are more sending than the other lands. And the uh, Baldios that are uh, also a common land uh, that was that were the land that was forest. They used uh, that that was not not fertile, but uh, so they use it to to forestation. Okay, thank you. Um, Tim, thank you so much for your question. Uh, I, I would like to add the following regarding uh, the commons, the Maninhos or Baldios. Uh, in fact, in Portugal, uh, during the Estado Novo dictatorship, we had um, a forest plan um, for um, mostly the, the north and central Portugal. And the commons, they, were, uh, they have been uh, took over by the, the state um, for uh, plantation uh, of mostly pines and other uh, forest species. Um, so what emerged? from, uh, let's say, the, 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 the mid-20th century was a certain type of uh, forest that was not um, in balance with uh, uh, the social, economic and environmental conditions. And um, mostly uh, after 1975, uh, forest fires began to be very um, frequent and uh, in a certain way um, that represents a failure of that silvicultural model. Uh, on the other hand, these forest fires also promoted the proliferation of acacias, which are in fact prepared for this kind of um, 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 uh, I think this sort of um, perturbation. Uh, Ecological perturbation, mm -hmm. and as a con so uh, we we might we might even say that the proliferation of acacias to a certain point uh, is more a consequence and not a cause of uh, ecological transformations or landscape transformations. Um, just one more thing. Yeah. Yes, that's it. And uh, in Portugal, uh, acacia was never used for perfumery. Uh, uh, acacias, uh, uh, either the, Aust the, the uh, Australian acacias, either those that come from uh, Central America. Uh, but they have uh, many uh, folk uses that uh, persist still today. And I think we should uh, pay some attention to those uh, vernacular uses. They mm -hmm. might help us to find ways of dealing with these plants in uh, uh, a more, um, uh, let's say, to find conditions for a better coexistence with these plants. Yeah, absolutely agree. The traditional environmental knowledge is, is of huge relevance today, even more than uh, for the past decades. I think it's time to um, conclude this session and to thank all the speakers, Ana Isabel, Luis, uh, Manuel and Rafael for excellent presentations and, and, and stimulating thoughts um, for an invitation uh, to, to, to visit also the regions uh, you have been studying. As mentioned before, this session is recorded and it will come on the uh, chat. I just wanted to invite uh, you all to the um, next uh, session. It's the third seminar of environmental history today is on the 20th of April and brings us to South America, to the Paramos of Bogota, around Bogota, Colombia, and is also part of the Environmental History Week organized by the American Society of Environmental History. See you there. Have a nice evening. Keep well and stay healthy and safe and see you on the next seminar. Goodbye.